you got big dreams and bad jeans, you are in the right place. Bromley shirts are available at barbellapparel.com. Link is in the description. This is my fifth attempt at making this video. This started out as an evidence-based deep dive into volume recommendations for muscle growth. But in doing the research for this video, I came across so many dead ends and so many pitfalls in the research that I couldn't just repeat the same numbers that had been popping up in other videos and other publications. See, science at its core is supposed to give us predictive powers over the world. The so-called hard sciences bump right up against the laws of physics, which follow constant rules that can be expressed in fixed mathematical equations. Applying physics, chemistry, engineering to the real world requires certainty. If you have the incorrect model, it gets you exposed quickly and in a big way. It's a company failing to invent the next billion dollar tech product or faulty architecture costing people their lives. So these sciences only thrive when everyone is stress testing these ideas, applying skepticism and double checking each other's work with the utmost precision. But it's important to note, all academic disciplines are not created equal. The further you are from the fundamental pieces of reality, the more complexity you have to contend with and the more muddied and uncertain your models become. MBA programs teach you about business and economics, but are often devalued by employers who recognize that real world experience is a better predictor of success than education alone. Social sciences don't have a method for tracking the efficacy of their models. They don't tend to reward skepticism, and they base many of their assumptions on weak evidence or outdated models like the blank slate theory. Now these academic departments get away with it because for whatever reason, no one is looking at them to make predictions. Similarly, exercise science can't make training predictions about what will work best or even work at all for any one individual. I often relate it to martial arts like jujitsu, a real discipline with real consequences, but where you would never expect academic research to be able to inform better strategies. So like martial arts, let's look at the different schools of thoughts that have defined gym culture up until now. You have people who do many isolation movements over many repeating sets, and you have those that do barbell only work. You have those who follow a stimulate, don't annihilate approach, leaving many of reps in the tank to keep the training stress quality versus those who take the blood and guts approach and go way beyond failure to reach maximal muscular exhaustion. You have people who do unreasonable amounts of work with high frequency throughout the week, and you have those who are pure low volume minimalists. Now, each of these approaches in both bodybuilding and other strength sports have evolved their own set of rules and recommendations based on the years of experience of the people who have ran them. And there are no shortage of elite and recreational lifters to testify to how potentially good each system can be. Now the scientific literature has settled on a few staple recommendations that seem to hold all of these different tribes under its umbrella. Number one, reps don't seem to matter. Research suggests that three to 30 reps is comparable for growth so long as it's taken sufficiently close to failure, which answers the question of why somebody can get really big doing sets of four and five or sets of 25 and 30. Number two, the importance of effort. Five is often repeated as the magic amount of reps in reserve. The basic idea is that if you are within five sets of momentary muscular failure, the conditions for hypertrophy seem to be better than if you are outside of it. And that coincides with most of the wisdom around growing muscle. Number three, the cap of volume in a workout. Six to eight sets for a muscle in one workout is often cited as the point before the effectiveness drops off, with the caveat that rest periods are sufficiently long enough. And this also fits a wide variety of training approaches as some of the bodybuilders who do many sets in a workout like Jay Cutler often use very short rest periods and didn't rest very long. Number four, dose relationship of volume per week. Now this is one of the most widely cited bits of information in exercise science as there have been a lot of studies that show volume tends to result in more growth compared to groups that do less volume. Now all of these broadly fit with what we see in gym culture as a whole. The fact that you can grow muscle at five reps in 20, that effort is important to growth and that more total work tends to correspond with more growth isn't revelatory, but you might think that these recommendations are a bit, I don't know, oversimplified and that they don't give a lot more insight about what to do long term. These are all very big ranges, like certainly a big chunk of trainees are doing something between three and 30 reps with high effort between 10 and 20 sets per week. They don't all just see permanent growth without stopping. They all eventually plateau. So how do these recommendations inform what to do then? And what is more important to the individual, adhering to these optimal ranges or finding what works best for them regardless? The inability of research to answer these questions conclusively is really just the tip of the iceberg. It turns out that there are a lot more problems than just overly vague ranges.
Exercise science studies often struggle to find a sample of people who are representative of the typical trainee. Many studies use untrained subjects who are notoriously sensitive to any growth stimulus. For someone who has never lifted weights, cardio actually builds muscle. And on the other hand, there is a massive dearth of accomplished lifters represented in research with almost no studies done on elite bodybuilders. Uh, Fraud, if I said to you, Fraud, I have this great study, you're gonna have to, for the next 10 weeks, just do X workout, you know, that's a canned workout. Uh, are, you, are you gonna yeah. say, you hey, sign me up for that, it's just. So whatever conclusions can be pulled out of the research that permeates exercise science can't be scaled all the way to the top. Crucial variables like how quickly a person responds to a stress, how high their potential ceiling is, how much work they can sustain, even their psychology are all determined by genetic differences, by their level of advancement and the type of stress that they have most recently conditioned themselves to. And research has essentially no ability to control for these things. Consider this, if you're a college lifter who's right in the throes of a brutal volume program like Smolov or have been doing two-a-days with your football team, jumping into the low volume group for a research study you volunteered for will almost certainly result in a net loss. No wonder professional lifters and bodybuilders aren't chomping at the bit to spend 12 weeks as the control in a study. But on the other hand, if you're the guy who is currently out of shape, who used to bench 315 back in the day, but can barely do 10 pushups right now, you will slingshot closer to those old numbers with just about any consistent stimulus. And whatever group you were in is going to look good as a result. Now, all groups in a study tend to have high and low performers represented. The conclusions that get summarized as this protocol was better than that are simply an average of the people in the study. I'll give the same program to a group of people and some will gain almost nothing and some are gaining 20% increase in muscle. So yeah. what we report in research are the averages. Each one responding for completely different reasons. Consider this study that separated the low, medium, and high responders after the study was done and calculated if they experienced more, less, or the same amount of volume from what they were doing immediately before. Now, while there's an average trend of more volume correlating with greater responses, each group from low to high responders have people who both added and dropped substantial amounts of volume from what they were doing before. Okay, okay, so individual predictions are hard to do. So let's say we're going to forego those predictions for individuals and lower our standards to just finding what tends to be best for a population of diverse individuals. Let's consider how many people we actually need in each study to have confidence in our conclusions. A power analysis is used to determine how many subjects you need for this. According to James Krieger in his volume Bible, I would need approximately 100 subjects per group to declare a 5% versus 10% gain in muscle size as statistically significant 80% of the time. If you only had 10 subjects per group, I get a statistical power of approximately 30%, which means that with only 10 subjects, you will declare a 5 versus 10% gain in muscle size as statistically significant in only 30 out of 100 studies. This means that most weight training studies on volume are essentially set up to fail to detect important differences. So meta-analysis or a study of multiple studies becomes extremely important as it broadens the number of subjects and tests to see if the differences are seen over many studies. In Krieger's meta-analysis comparing sets per exercise, he looked at three groups, one set, two to three sets, and four to six sets. But there were only eight studies that met his criteria and only two of those featured four to six sets. There wasn't data to evaluate results based on training status, whether they were trained or untrained subjects. It didn't take into account weekly volume, just what was done in a single session, and only counted sets per exercise, not sets per workout. Now, James obviously put a lot of work into this and was extremely forthright with the shortcomings of his meta-analysis, but it begs a question of what we are supposed to get out of this. Now, in 2017, Krieger and Schoenfeld and others put out their meta-analysis comparing weekly volume, and it's been often cited ever since. But the groups were only divided into five sets or less, five to nine sets per week, or 10 plus sets, with very few studies reaching the 20 set mark. And from what I remember, they didn't have the density of data above 10 sets to conclude confidently, first of all, any specifics, well, what happens above 10 sets, just that it's better. Mm -hmm. And also a lot of people were asking Brad about, well, what about what about north of 20? And he was just like, guys, we have like four studies total above 10 sets. Generally, they're all better than the studies below, but one of them is 21 sets and nothing else above that. So we and as it turns out, 10 sets or more in a week isn't considered especially high volume by normal training standards. 
the problem persists. Are you looking for access to exclusive programs from the best minds in the field and some of your favorite YouTube influencers? Then look no further than Boost Camp. Boost Camp is a long-term sponsor of this channel and I wouldn't be partnered with them if they didn't provide a great product. If you want optimal performance, you cannot just wing your weight selection. You have to make deliberate steps forward. So you need a program and you need a way to track progress on it. They make it easy to track your workouts from the convenience of your phone so you never have to rely on your sloppy handwriting or your bad memory. And they give you access to a library of exclusive programs from some of the most well-known names in the business. Eric Helms, Bryce Lewis, Jeff Schofield, Bald Omni-Man, and yours truly. We all have programs up there that can only be found on the app and it is absolutely free. My programs, Bull Mastiff and 70s Powerlifter are both up there. And you can also check out Full Sturker, which tells you how to get strongman jacked using the things you find in a corporate gym. So special thank you to Boost Camp for making this channel possible. Unburden yourself from the hard business of making the perfect program from scratch. We've got them pre-made for you. Download their app right now by clicking the link in the description. The conclusions from these studies are often evaluated as if the observed difference is a new rule that can just be plugged into any system to guarantee a better result. But it's important to understand the context behind every observed difference in a study. Take for example this Nippard video tackling the question of training to failure. He includes this study by Carroll which shows less hypertrophy coming from the group that trained to failure and includes it into his columns to make a global decision about failure being good or bad for size. Except this study was using athletes in the context of specific athletic training, not specific hypertrophy training. They were doing compound movements and a whole body split multiple times per week, sprinting on alternate days, and more importantly, they used a block periodization structure that is not typically used for hypertrophy and certainly not used in most research that it's being compared to. If you're wondering about how training to failure affects the strength and size of athletes during a periodized athletic strength program, this study might give some insight, but if you're wondering about how training to failure generally impacts muscle growth in a hypertrophy program, this is next to useless. But the study still ends up in a simplified chart where failure gets a thumbs up or a thumbs down as if the noise created by different contexts don't wash away all the meaningful conclusions you can make. We have a problem with how popular culture engages with the information. Most people are not PhDs, have not recently taken a statistics course, and do not have the time to read the fine print to evaluate these important types of differences. While Schoenfeld, Krieger, Helms, and others can pull double duty, telling people the limitations of these papers and how you can't use them to inform your training directly, the vast majority of people who are reading them are doing so in hopes of getting a leg up on their training and are taking shortcuts with their analysis. They're seeing the conclusions of each meta-analysis as do this one trick for gains and forming a less useful approach to training in the process. Now, this would be the case even if we had the best data, but unfortunately. Now, this is where shade is going to be thrown. Greg Knuckles put it more diplomatically than I would have. A criticism that I do have of not not all, but a lot of the researchers, researchers in our field um, is relatively poor statistical literacy. Uh, the the mathier folks, like the the inherently mathier folks, tend to just kind of like gravitate to other STEM fields uh, <laughs> instead of exercise science. Those who are good at math and science tend to end up in math and science. If that seems harsh, well, I'm not the one who did the study finding that 85% of exercise science papers had statistical errors in them. Uh, and a recent paper that was that was like just published like last, like either earlier this week or last week, um, reported that like somewhere around 85% of the meta-analyses in our field have at least one statistical error. <laughs> there was a lot of controversy over this Rodales study showing incredibly high volumes being productive for untrained lifters over six months, which Lyle McDonald called directly a shit show. Being the Rodelli trash fire, which I'll always say shit, because unless you want to tell me how a calisthenic group gained more muscle than uh, the low volume weight training and beginners needed like 37 to 45 sets to grow, uh, it's, it's garbage data, but whatever. Alongside with Schoenfeld's replication of that study, which Lyle also called out, it turns out that Brad took the measurements himself and did so unblinded, meaning he knew which measurements were in which group, which is not great for controlling for bias. And it turned out that the statistical conclusions weren't accurate. It's also worth noting that the 45 sets 
discovered as the upper limit in this study have not been adopted into general recommendations. Everyone involved still sticks to 10 to 20 sets as their general guideline, but there isn't much in the way of an acknowledgement or repudiation of this study either. Now there's an obvious disparity in rigor with exercise science compared to other academic arenas. And I don't know if it's because of the type of individual the field selects for, meatheads, or if it's because so many people in the field intuit that their findings just really don't matter that much. A field like exercise science where many of the authorities don't have a master's degree or higher tells you a lot about the state of exercise science, and that includes me. That doesn't mean that these individuals aren't smart, but it speaks to the global standards held in the field. Now, I'm sorry if that's harsh, but there's a ton of cloudiness in the research, yet people still get to their first 400 pound deadlift, and Mr. Olympia winners still weigh 280 pounds on stage, Nobody who is conducting yet another study comparing sets to failure or not with half serious college kids actually believes that anything paradigm shifting is going to come out of it. It's going to broadly support what people already know or it's going to conflict. In which case everyone just says, yeah, there's a ton of confounding variables we can't account for. Oh well. So for that reason, the stakes for any one particular study are just super fucking low. This stuff isn't sending people to Mars, it's not curing cancer, and as of right now, it's not even making people train better. Now that takes us to the more insidious problem in this field, and that's fraud. Many studies by Barbalo were retracted, which put a big dent into the body of research. This seemed to be initiated by Greg Knuckles, who found statistical problems with values that were just too good to be true. An unusually high number of studies were coming out from this group, and the numbers some described as looking copy and pasted. And since the authors chose not to respond, the articles were then retracted by the publishers. The peer-reviewed process, which many see as the gatekeepers of such errors, doesn't catch most of this stuff. And where replication should be catching it, there virtually isn't any in this field. There are also accusations of outright fake numbers, where compound movements like squats are done to momentary muscular failure for repeated sets with very low rest periods, like one minute. Now, anyone with any experience at the gym understands how this just doesn't work, especially with average lifters who are not self-hating masochists. No one can squat five sets of eight to 12 to failure, right? It was listed as a rep max load on 90 seconds. It cannot be done. So it's been uh, about a week and I'm still waiting to um, get a video, y'all. Somebody doing uh, the workout from Brad's paper. Thousand bucks, no joke. One video, no edits. Prove me wrong, thousand bucks. No joke, no shit. How you define your variables and how well you can measure them is the most important aspect of any study, and exercise science struggles with both. For instance, the discussion of training effort gets watered down to a simple binary of failure or not to failure, but there's a lot of real estate in there that matters. For one, what the muscle experiences during a set to failure changes wildly based on variables that are impossible to control for, like how hard you're bouncing on a bench press. Compound movements taken to failure lead to form degradation, which changes how the muscle that's being studied experiences the stress, and failure generally occurs from some weak point rather than exhaustion of that muscle. If your midsection or back is particularly weak, getting close to failure on a squat is not going to have the same effect on your quads as a leg extension. And let's forget about the fact that nobody really takes barbell lifts to actual momentary muscular failure. Regardless, these compound barbell lifts routinely end up in these failure studies as the exercise of choice. Now there's a spectrum with effort that is important to define. Hit followers go well beyond the point of failure and most volume-based bodybuilders still actually reach momentary muscular failure on much of their work. Then there's volitional failure or a guess of what your last good rep is. And finally, there is stopping short of failure at some RIR or reps in reserve. Any coach who works with the average population will tell you that there is a huge problem using RPE or RIR as most trainees are just way off and the research actually supports this. In one study, 160 trained men were asked for the weight that they normally bench press for 10 reps in a workout. The median number was 16 reps when they were tested to failure and 26% of the people asked ended up doing 19 reps or more. Now, similar studies with RPE show inconsistencies with estimations as well, which begs the question, how do we have any accuracy of effort in any research that is supposed to compare work to failure with some amount of reps in reserve? The answer is we don't. So if we stop our conclusions at the point where our measurements are meaningful and significant, we have to accept 
that we can't speak with certainty about the small differences between RIRs, like leaving exactly one in the tank or exactly three, which is unfortunate because understanding the trade-off between incurring a ton of fatigue to get that last failure rep versus staying a rep or two short of failure and maintaining quality over multiple sets actually seems like it would be a productive area of investigation for the field of exercise science. Oh well. Now, exercise selection is also hugely important, but there is no standardization in the field across studies. Some volume studies count compound movements towards a particular muscle, like bench pressing for triceps or rowing for biceps. While there is an obvious stress to those muscles with those movements, I am not aware of any current active bodybuilder who considers a set of shoulder presses to be sufficiently stimulative for tricep growth. In the Bosvali meta-analysis from 2022, it was shown that there was no difference in going from 10 to 20 to 20 plus sets per week, except for triceps, where pressing movements were also counted towards tricep volume. But if you take those pressing sets away, like most trainees naturally would, then the recommendations for volume drops. In the Radali study, triceps responded to 45 sets per week with benching, overhead press, and one tricep exercise, each done three times per week. But in Schoenfeld's replication of it, only benching and overhead pressing was done with no tricep isolation, and there was no difference. Given how much of a difference can occur with changes in exercise selection and order, and how weak studies are by themselves, you would think that there would be an adherence to a more formalized and universally adopted template for conducting these studies so that replication and meta-analyses would have less noise and be able to be much more conclusive but every study seems to be doing its own thing with no regard for anyone else. Most published research is false. So recently, researchers in a number of fields have attempted to quantify the problem by replicating some prominent past results. The Reproducibility Project repeated 100 psychology studies, but found only 36% had a statistically significant result the second time around. And the strength of measured relationships were on average half those of the original studies. An attempted verification of 53 studies considered landmarks in the basic science of cancer only managed to reproduce six, even working closely with the original study's authors. These Again, if there were real stakes here, there would be mass coordination to get the best data. But the real stakes, it turns out, are just not getting published. In this Veritasium video, Why Most Published Research is Wrong, Derek Mueller explains how the selection of studies increases the chances of incorrect conclusions being published and how replication studies are actively disincentivized because they aren't likely to make it up in a journal. Like take the precognition study from the start of this video. Three researchers attempted to replicate one of those experiments and what did they find? Well, surprise, surprise, the hit rate they obtained was not significantly different from chance. When they tried to publish their findings in the same journal as the original paper, they were rejected. The reason? The journal refuses to publish replication studies. So if you're a scientist, the successful strategy is clear. Don't even attempt replication studies because few journals will publish them. And there is a very good chance that your results won't be statistically significant anyway. Now beyond the limited access to participants, the faulty statistical analysis, and the inability to control for confounding variables, there is a fatal flaw that goes even deeper, and that is the very way that training stress is conceptualized for muscle growth. You'll notice people talk about the different dose of effort or volume as contributing some percentage of gains compared to another dose, as if growth happens in discrete packets and in every repetition and every set and every workout, you're exchanging one unit of training for some fixed amount of growth. While this conceptually might be useful in thought experiments, it has become the default way of thinking about training stress. All other sports recognize that the human organism acts like an entire system where the parts are greater than the sum of the whole, and that includes barbell sports like powerlifting and Olympic lifting. Consider the model of fitness versus fatigue, where the drops and increases in ability are directly affected by how much fatigue you've accumulated. As it's been said, fatigue masks fitness. So if you're training hard enough to grow, you are definitionally accumulating fatigue. This is why dropping volume leads to new levels of strength in a powerlifting taper, why deloads are incorporated to allow progress to continue, and why some site gains from going from a volume approach to an intensity approach. But when you have a lifter that's been training with a ton of volume for a long time and you pull that volume back, let them recover a little bit from not you know, doing these crazy, you know, the Arnold type routines, which they is what all those guys realize were doing. the adaptation yes, is that's what, what it, Exactly. They realize and then the they adaptation. Go, they go, oh, well, it's higher intensity that works. And it's like, no, no, no. It's higher intensity on the back end of really high volume for a prolonged period of time. Sure. Right. Accumulated fatigue matters and less stressful modes have utility here. 
For instance, most classical periodization approaches have lighter days or low effort sessions. It doesn't make sense in a Shiko program to ask what percentage of gains comes from the many submax warm-up sets compared to a single Bruh. top set. Just like it doesn't make sense to ask how much the recovery workout in the Texas method contributes to growth or progression overall. These programs see the work in each day and week as a dial that can be turned to balance stimulus and fatigue. And big workouts and big weeks of training create more growth stress, while smaller workouts and smaller weeks of training allow more recovery, which allows more growth to be realized. So while workouts have the potential to do so much more than just cause growth or not cause growth, this hypertrophy model can't say anything about complex training splits where a day of work isn't supposed to be singularly responsible for a fixed amount of growth. Take this study, we're adding a fatiguing 20% set before the working sets contributed to more growth than the control. How do you talk about that in a model that treats every rep as having some fixed amount of growth? You can't, our hands are tied unless we use a different model. It also ignores the dynamic of time, the most relevant component to any long-term trainee, which changes what percentage of gains will come from a particular type of stress. Mike Isratel said it perfectly in his interview with Milo Wolf that while most people conceptualize more sets as giving marginal gains, if you're plateaued and not seeing any growth, those extra sets might be the thing that kicks you forward. Keep in mind that the relationship between volume and growth does taper off at the tail end. So if you're going from say 20 sets for a muscle group to 30, specialize, you may not see as much additional growth as if you think it's just linear. Right. Yes, but I will uh, really quick, in addition to that, a lot of the people who find themselves candidates for specialization phases are people who realistically look at their pecs over the course of a year and go, I, I legitimately think I haven't grown at all. Then the difference between 30 sets and 20 sets can be the difference between zero and anything above, which for is sure. technically infinite, you know, like yep. infinitely better gains if it's zero is your baseline. So for this throws a wrench in the discussion of junk volume, which would also refer to fixed numerical values of volume as being worthless by being generally too much, instead of talking about them in relationship to what the training was doing before. In reality, the question of what percentage of your gains a certain amount of volume can give doesn't make any sense without considering the person and what their current training looks like. One man's junk is indeed another man's treasure. Eventually, your response to a type and amount of stress will slow with diminished returns and then be outpaced by the accumulation of fatigue, which will lead to plateau and regression. So let's assume that during a period of growth, the amount of volume and effort was fixed from the beginning. You did the same number of sets and worked equally as hard from start to finish. Do you call that volume optimal because it grew you in the beginning? Or do you call it suboptimal because eventually you stopped responding to it? It's not either answer that's silly. It's the question which only allows for silly answers. Now, the culmination of all of this is my belief that the evidence-based community is so hopelessly behind the curve that there is no hope for comeback. Only very recently have researchers started to tap around the idea of volume cycling as perhaps being worth considering. Which suggests that volume may not be absolute, it may be more of an effect of change. I think there are some theoretical benefits to possibly volume cycling. It's purely, I would say, hypothetical at this point in my volume. Bold move, suggesting that there isn't just a fixed range of training that people should discover and then adhere to forever. Really going out on a limb on that one. The best single thing to correlate to substantial long-term muscle growth is progression. It's absolutely key. It's the thing that drives your training forward week to week and the sign that your training is doing what it's supposed to, whether your training consists of one set or 50. There is no one who has taken their normal working sets of squats from 135 to 315 or who reached the last plate on a leg extension machine who did not end up with meteor quads to show for it. And if you are particularly focused on hypertrophy and are using the best targeted exercises and precise execution for your physique goals, the same rules of progression will apply and the results will certainly be compounded. When stagnation occurs, which it does for everyone, continued progression needs to be addressed and you do that by adding stress, implementing a different stress, or allowing more recovery. For increasing stress, concentrated periods of high amounts of work that might be unsustainable long-term might also be needed to cause growth in the short term when you've become resistant to that stimulus. 
This is Lee Haney and Arnold Schwarzenegger talking about their hardest training being the 12 weeks leading into the Olympia because that's when that training was most important and they couldn't sustain that work year round. It's John Meadows talking about how we did short specialization phases to increase work for weak points while keeping everything else at maintenance. It's Tudor Bompa writing about periodization for bodybuilders and serious strength training. It's Mike Isertel using terminology like mesocycles and deloads to talk about hypertrophy training and in the process actually addressing the need for fatigue management and deliberate inclusion of novel stimulus. All training is cyclical and you're either aware of it and acting accordingly or you're not and you're just reacting. The short answer is to throw optimal out the fucking window. We can hypothesize that a thing called optimal exists, but the resolution given in the research doesn't come close to finding that for you or telling you how to find it yourself. I think a future where nanorobots are collecting data points all over your body, giving real-time data to a supercomputer that aggregates it against every other lifter in the world, might be able to tell you something specific about what you should do next. That computer would theoretically know your temperament, your genetic predisposition, and the limitations that you need to worry about in your training, and it could program around them with crushing accuracy. As long as you do what the supercomputer says, you'll grow, and there's a 99% chance that each successful block would be better than anything else you could have potentially done. In my mind, that is the gold standard of exercise science with giving predictability to individuals, as that's the minimum standard in physics and every other hard science. So if the decisions that can lead to such predictably better outcomes do exist, the reality is that you just don't have access to them. Like the nano robots I just talked about, it doesn't exist in this reality, it's fiction. So change your damn expectations. The real based take is to assume that whatever you do in the gym is actually likely not to give any gains. That's right, if you talk to anyone in their 40s or above who has been lifting since their teenage years, which isn't hard to find, virtually all of them, amateur to elite, have gone through long periods of no progress, punctuated by short periods of quick progress. That means that statistically, any one block of training you look at was more likely to have done nothing at all than to have actually made you better. So the difference in adding another Christmas brisket worth of mass to your frame over a training lifetime or in getting an invite to nationals versus not being invited in the first place is the difference between doing something or nothing between now and your next training block. So with respect to what you do in the gym between this week and next, your optimal path is not best out of the field of all possibilities. Optimal is just something instead of nothing. And it turns out that there are a lot of ways to get the body to do something and absolutely none of it has anything to do with the number of PubMed articles that you've read. So that's all I got for today, guys. I know many of you might be disillusioned to hear my severe take on the state of exercise science, but I actually think it's really good news. With all trainees, the thing that is going to keep you from continuing to do better over time is your fixation on what you respond to and how that needs to be tweaked over time to give you the best possible outcome. And I guarantee that if you took a group that did that, get attention to themselves and chased bench PRs the way they chase a paycheck, you would see universally better growth when compared to the group of people that tend to get lost in the weeds and expend insane amounts of effort trying to pull conclusions from exercise science studies that they simply can't support. So let me know what you think in the comments. Better yet, take it to Patreon. That is where I upload videos early. I upload my training. I give advice. I answer DMs. That is the easiest way to get in contact with me. Thank you so much for watching, guys. Until next time, this is Bromley. I'll see you.